Hello, I'm Tim Burcham, Director of the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture's Northeast Rice Research and Extension Center located here in Greenfield, Arkansas. Today I'm joined by Dr. Steve Green, who is a professor of soil and water conservation at Arkansas State University and also holds a partial appointment with the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture as a research person. Steve, welcome to the program today and thanks for coming and sharing some information about this really great project that uh, you and some of your colleagues are working on here. We've got beans on this field this year, but next year this will rotate to row rice. That's correct. So can you give us just a little bit of, maybe a little bit of background on the other cooperators? I know this is a great uh, collaborative effort between Arkansas State University College of Agriculture as well as uh, University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture researchers. That's right. So some of our, our collaborators include Trent Roberts and Matt Fryer with the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture, as well as Ed Brown and Ahmed Hashem at Arkansas State University. Yeah. So really a great collaborative project here and just 14 miles uh, south of Arkansas State University in Jonesboro. So it's a great location for your team to work uh, close to the university and allows you good access to this particular field project. Absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity, Tim. Well, Steve, give our viewers just a little bit of a background about this particular project and some of the variables that we're looking at here. And again, I talked about it being in soybean this year, but we'll be moving into row rice next year. But can you give our viewers just kind of an overview of this particular research project? Absolutely. So this is a, a 30 acre field that we have here, so, uh, soybean rice rotation. And the, the field was recently leveled, precision leveled, uh, to a grade of, of 0.1 per 100 and so with that we have about uh, a 12 inch cut towards the bottom of the field and about a, a 12 inch fill at the top of the field. So we've got that situation where we've got a recently precision level field which induces some soil degradation. What we're interested in is looking at how cover crops can be used as a land leveling remediation tool. Right. And I know uh, chicken litter is a typical uh, remediation tool. Now we did not use chicken litter on this particular field because we're looking at what cover crop specifically is, how that's impacting that, correct? That's correct. We know that cover crops provide some, some biological enhancement. They stimulate the microorganisms in the soil and facilitate nutrient cycling. So we're really interested in finding out what uh, capacity or what influence that cover crop has on a recently cut field. Great. Well, Steve, I know you, your research team, you, you introduced some of the cooperators, the researchers at the, at the start of our program today, but I know you also have some of our division research technicians and other ASU students that are that are, have been really important to this large-scale project. That's right. We had an undergraduate student, Harper Martin, yes. who did some of the preliminary work uh, on the recently cut field. Um, we also have Matt Knatzer, one of our U of A System Division of Agriculture technicians, right. as well as Addison Nobles, who is one of our technicians at Arkansas State University. Right. Again, that great collaborative effort between the division and Arkansas State University College of Agriculture, really, it's great and, and uh, it's been a great collaboration for us so far. So, you know, we talked about the cut and fill of this particular field and I would say on the farm right now, we've got quite a few fields that are sloped at a tenth, but this one is 2,000 feet long. <laughs> And therefore, we do go from, as you said, uh, you know, anywhere from uh, like 0.7 feet of fill all the way down to 1.3 feet of cut, which is probably getting down to that, that compacted zone here in these Henry Silt Loam soils. So, you know, how did the research team do your experimental blocking to take advantage of the different cut levels that we have throughout the field? So first of all, our, our cover crops that we implemented here, we've got various small grain crops, rye, triticale, black oat, and then we have a blend of all three of those. Yes. And then we also have what we term a, a soybean blend that's got rye and crimson clover and kale. So those are our, our treatments and we're replicating that three t or four times across the field. And to capture that variation in cut and fill, 
we, we imported the cut sheet data yes. into an ArcGIS and identified locations within each plot that are at a 12 inch fill, a 6 inch fill, a zone that had no cut and no fill, right. neutral, line. neutral as is, yes. and then also a, a 6 inch cut and a 12 inch cut. Yeah. So those cut zones we're getting down to that subsoil yes, where the soil is really degraded right. and if you remember in the summer after they leveled this field the weeds wouldn't even take <laughs> off in that cut zone it was uh, it was uh, uh, quite a sight to see uh, I, I do recall uh, bush hogging that lower segment because we we cut the upper portion of this field for hay and it was so poor at the bottom end that uh, the uh, folks that did the hay work did not want to uh, spend any time on it. So uh, <laughs> definitely uh, was showing us some things there even before we got into the crop rotation. Well, Steve, I know soil health is one of the important aspects and one of your key research topics. I call him Dr. Soil Health. That's, that's what I call Dr. Green. And uh, so can you talk a little bit about soil health and and some of the parameters that we're looking at in this particular field and why that's an important uh, aspect for our farmers here in Northeast Arkansas that are in a rice and soybean rotation mode. Sure, I, I am very passionate about soil health and, and a lot of people have a, a little bit of a misunderstanding about soil health and really it's about optimizing the soil so that we can benefit from the, the functions that the soil can provide. Uh, we want to optimize those functions, the nutrient cycling functions, the infiltration functions, and then we can supplement with the rest of what our crop needs. That improves our, our resource efficiency, it improves our profitability, and so we're looking at cover crops as a way to improve the soil health and improve the functioning and and in the end our hope is to improve profitability for the farmer right yes of course if if we can you know reduce our inputs and as you know this year in particular input prices have really uh been on the uptick and it's a it's a it's a problem from the bottom line for all of our producers here so those soil health parameters are something that uh, the benefits that we can gain from those not only from an infiltration standpoint which as an engineer i look at that as a great opportunity for you know to tra trap and hold water and it reduces our evaporative losses as well but also to look at the incorporation of that material and start building up that soil profile and those beneficial organisms right i know one of the things that uh, that i'm sure you would would say dr bircham you're right but the soil health doesn't change overnight does it? it doesn't change overnight it does take some time but we can we can make it move quickly if we implement proper practices yes, so some of the uh, attributes that we're going to be focusing on is really looking at soil organic matter and, and our cover crops can help uh, increase soil organic matter content. We'll also be looking at active carbon. Right. The active carbon in the soil, that's the, the part of the organic matter that the microorganisms can readily use for food and for energy, right. which will then stimulate their activity and provide better nutrient cycling. Absolutely. So what are some of the soil health parameters that uh, your team will be monitoring uh, on this field? So apart from soil organic matter and active carbon, we're also looking at bulk density. Our farmers are very concerned about compaction, so bulk density is a, a big parameter for us, as well as some, some microbiological properties. One of those uh, includes fluorescein diacetate analysis. That's a big word, Dr. Green. It's basically, it's, a, uh, it's an analysis that we do that, that captures overall microbial activity. So it basically gives you a sense of what the microbial activity is in that particular soil profile. That's correct. So we may potentially see differences as we move down in these cut zones. That may be one of the parameters that we may see some differences. Well, Although that might take time, right? I can tell you we've seen differences okay. in the cut zones. Yes, sir. Um, Harper Martin is the one who evaluated the cut zones prior to cover crop establishment. And, and the results that, that she uh, obtained showed that the cut zone had a huge impact. What's interesting, Tim, is you know, we, we might have expected that the no cut, no fill zone, the natural zone, uh, 
was higher, and it was, organic matter was higher, active carbon higher, fluorescein diastate, I'm going to call that FDA. FDA, FDA like was higher. <laughs> but as we go down, the cut zones were dramatically lower yes. in each of those attributes. What is interesting is the fill zones were also quite a bit lower than the native no cut, no fill. They weren't as bad as the cut zones, but because the fill zones have soil that was My partially man, came from the cut zone. Possible, so it's a mix of subsoil and topsoil, right. and so it's not as good as the native no cut, no fill zone. And that's certainly something we would have expected probably because as you said, when they're moving soil from that cut up here, they're moving some of that deeper soil up here to the fill side. That's right. So really a uh, great observation. I'm glad the data is helping us really solidify that. Steve, in addition to the soil health properties, I know your team's been working really hard on the plant properties as well. Can you share just a little bit about some of the information that your team has been recording with regard to, you know, the soybean crop this year? Sure. So one of the important attributes that we evaluated was soybean population. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we want to have a good population of, of planted soybean. And as, as we go from the uh, fill zone down to the cut zone, we did see a decrease in, in plant population. What we found interesting was that when we averaged across the cover crop plots compared to the no cover crop plots, that was a dramatic difference as well. We had 111,000 plants per acre on our cover crop plots, whereas our no cover crop plots were down at 94,000. Wow plants per acre. So, fairly significant. Significance. And, and as you've noticed walking down the field from the top of the field to the bottom of the field, those plants get a lot shorter. They sure do. Uh, we're, we're collecting plant height right. and, and weed pressure, right. uh, but just observationally you see a dramatic difference in plant height from the top of the field to the bottom of the field. Well, can you talk about the weed pressure a little more? I just know as as the director here, and, and I, of course I'm by this field every day, and some of our other fields, we've had some particular weed issues. Uh, it seems that the weed pressure with the cover crop for this field has been fairly minimal. Now we, of course, have, have done some uh, herbicide treatment on the field, but uh, you might, if you want to share with our viewers what your general observations are on the weed pressure, maybe with the cover crop versus the, the non-cover crop. Yeah, so we, we have seen some differences cover crop to non-cover crop, though the, the main difference we're seeing is higher weed pressure in the no-cut zone. I see. More weed pressure there. We get down into the cut zone, less weed pressure, well, we scalped off the whole weed seed bank, That's so right. there's not much there. Probably moved it up to the headland. There's yeah. more weed pressure in the headland, <laughs> yes. but, but not as much as in the, the no-cut, no-fill zone, which is a, an active weed seed bank. Yeah. Well, I know another important aspect of this project has been the collaboration with Dr. Ahmed Hashim, who is our uh, uh, assistant professor of, of agricultural systems technology, and his graduate student, Rush Evans, and they've been flying with the UAV, uh, un unmanned aerial vehicle or a drone, with a very impressive array of multi multispectral cameras, thermal imaging, and those kinds of things. Can you share just a little bit about uh, that activity and how that's adding value to this research project as well? Absolutely. So that, that activity is essential in our, in our project to look at plant health throughout the system. They've been flying here regularly. It's not just a one-time or two-time flyover. It's every other week out here flying these fields. And we're, we're very interested in and that remote sensing ability to detect plant health in season right. so that we can make in season decisions to, to enhance our crop production. So we'll be doing a lot of data analysis over the, over the winter to look at that, especially after we harvest the beans and can correlate the, the yield data with some of that remote sensing imagery data. 
Well, I know we, we worked on a, a paper that was submitted that looked at some of that data from another location, and it is the quintessential big data problem because every time you fly these fields, and particularly at the scale that we're talking about here on a 30-acre field, generates a lot of data. So I know Emily Bellis is another one of our uh, uh, assistant professors at Arkansas State University that's also come on board with us and has a partial research appointment with the division and her expertise is in the artificial intelligence area mm -hmm. and I know that's been a, a great help to our team as well as uh, Dr. Hashim and and Rush coming out and flying the, flying this and then gathering that data together but having another person with those kind of computer skills has been a, a great thing for our team as well. Absolutely and, and the, the whole goal is to be able to make in-season decisions that can be profitable for our farmers. Absolutely. We want to be able to make those decisions and make those uh, those inputs in a timely manner. Absolutely. Well Steve, uh, we're still a few weeks away from harvest although we're senescing quite a bit as we can see in the background here but can you just share you know some general observations on the project for, for our viewers today? Sure. Um, basically what we've seen and I've shared some of this already with the uh, with the the cut zones especially, um, but as we as we continue to look at the the cover crop impact, um, that's that's a very high interest to us to be able to optimize those resource inputs uh, to be able to to capitalize in, on that. One of the things I haven't mentioned to you, Tim, yet is uh, the bulk density. Yes. We took bulk density measurements throughout this field. Uh, so um, we've got six treatments in each of our four blocks right. and then we've got five different cut zones in each of those plots that generates 120 sampling points for us right. and as we've uh, analyzed the bulk density we uh, we see a, a, a stark difference in the bulk density. Wow. Um, much higher bulk density on the lower end of the field which is the cut end of the field right. Um, less in the middle of the no cut, no fill zone, and even less in the fill zone. Now, one of the things that we're also doing is we've got a, a, a wood lot not too far from here, right. uh, at the north end of the station. Over here. Yes. We collect samples from the wood lot as well. Okay. Uh, it's, on, it's on a Henry Silt loam, yep. same soil type, and so we're, we're able to look at um, a native, a, 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 our somewhat native, yeah. we're able to look at a somewhat native uh, bulk density, yeah. uh, microbial activity, yeah. um, aggregate stability, some of those attributes that we're interested in to see what would it be if we weren't in an agricultural production. And our goal is to get our, our agricultural production fields functioning to a level that they can uh, get close to what a, a native field might, might be. Yeah. Well, I mentioned earlier, of course, we'll come back in when we harvest the soybean crop, we'll come back in with the six treatments again on the cover crop and then pull beds to help us with our watering, but then row rice next year. So it'll be really exciting to look at this work going into the next year as we move into the rice soybean rotation. I know your team's excited about looking at the rice component next year as well. We are excited about that and some of the, the differences in our cover crop treatments will have uh, more legumes in that right. before rice yes. than, than we do before soybeans. So some of those treatments will, will change. Some of them will maintain the same treatment for consistency, but we'll include more legumes going into rice. Great. Well, Steve, thank you so much for joining us today, and I appreciate your work here at the Narek Farm. Uh, this research project that is a collaboration between University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture scientists as well as uh, numerous, as I've mentioned, Arkansas State scientists that also have joint appointments with the division. So we appreciate your team working so hard and the collaboration that you have here. I want to do a special shout out to Mr. Jason McGee, who's a local uh, rice and soybean farmer here in our region, who helped us before we even had a tractor get this ready for cover crop, and so he provided tillage as well as pull the beds for us going into this. And also for Progeny Ag Products, uh, Steve, they donated all the soybean seed that we have here on this particular field. So we really appreciate them and, and their assistance with our program here. On behalf of myself and Dr. Steve Green, I just want to thank you for joining us today at this inaugural 
Northeast Rice Research and Extension Center field tour.